Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Hi, I'm Evgeny. Hi, I'm Dimitri. We have here Paul from the HEMA. Paul, can you please introduce yourself and the company? Sure. My name is Paul Valley, and I'm based here in Ottawa, Canada, and I'm a lifelong remote work entrepreneur. And uh, I founded a company called Pythian that focused on database and systems administration in 1997 and grew to be a large player in that space, helping a lot of media, retail, e-commerce, and technology companies manage their infrastructure. And uh, the special thing about Pythian was that most of our workforce that was delivering the work that we were doing was working from home. And Tehema as a product was born inside Pythian in order to enable uh, Pythian's large and trusted uh, remote workforce to access privileged accounts and all kinds of other uh, very difficult to secure and compliant sensitive workloads. And so Tehema was separated from Pythian as a separate business in the summer of 2019. So we are around a year after launch right now. Amazing. So what's the name of the offering or the product produced by Tehema that addressing the ZTNA remote access? Yeah, so what Tehema does is, Tehema is the name of the company, but it's also the name of our product. Uh, Tehema is a essentially a desktop as a service platform that is focused on all of the security compliance, orchestration, workflow automation, and path to data requirements that are actually needed to enable a remote team. So the offering uh, Tehema can be uh, selected by an enterprise and can be used to enable their internal team or third parties in about an hour. And it automatically collects all the necessary uh, compliance artifacts necessary to do that work. And it sets up all the zero trust networks to do that work. It has a very interesting architecture when compared to uh, traditional products in the secure access service edge market, but it also has a very, I would say next generation architecture when you combine, uh, when you review it in comparison to uh, desktop as a service technology. So you can think of it as a uh, desktop as a service platform that also includes uh, path to data. So secure access service edge like and zero trust network overlay features. Uh, and it also includes all of the other componentry that is necessary to make a remote team effective. So Paul, we actually would like to learn more about your architecture. We are a podcast about architecture. So please tell us how you guys set up, how it's working, how many pods you have or different ways to connect your customers and how sure. you have availability. Sure. So at Tehima, we like to think that we are the fastest, easiest, and most secure way to connect people to assets, to people to enterprise assets. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this very salesy sliding and explain how it works instead, because I know that your audience is very technical. Tehima philosophically, if you think of um, the internet's building block as the router, in Tehima, the, inter- the, the building block that we use is called the room. A room is a container for virtual desktops. And each of those virtual desktops has access to all of the necessary uh, items that are required to make a worker worker effective. So inside the room, you have the ability to create as many Linux and Windows virtual desktops as you want. You also have access to a completely audited file vault. This is akin to, I mean, those of you who have a financial sector background, very akin to a banking uh, file vault for deal flow. Uh, It has access to policy establishment and the ability to collect compliance with controls. It has firewall rules, including dynamic firewall rules that are uh, dynamically provisioned in exchange for uh, at at moments of privilege escalation. I can demonstrate that later. It also has uh, audit trail feature. The idea of a room is that everything that has happened in the room is perfectly witnessed. So a room is like a perfectly witnessed container for work. And the way that rooms are connected to... um, to customers' uh, infrastructure is using one of our secrets, which is our Tehema gateway. So the Tehema gateway is the mechanism that is installed on the customer premises in order to permit the virtual room that lives in the cloud to access the assets that the customer decides are available. So architecturally, the way that this works for the worker is they have a very light client on their desktop when the client supports Mac OS and Android and uh, Windows and Linux, and it also supports um, 
uh, iGel devices for those of you who are using uh, software-defined endpoints. I'm not sure if your audience is familiar, but this is an iGel software-defined endpoint. I'm just going to show it to you right here. If you boot off that device, you can, once you're on the Wi-Fi, be presented with a Tehama login window. And the second you're logged in, it's like your, uh, it's like your machine becomes the Tehama desktop in the cloud. Um, so that's what the, what the user is using here on the client side. Once they connect, they're using their machine that is in our virtual room. And the machine in the virtual room is then transparently able to connect through the gateway to the customer's enterprise assets. These assets can be in their private data center or they can be in any cloud data center. It really doesn't matter to us. Anywhere you can install the Tehama gateway, which is a virtual appliance, you can connect assets to the uh, Tehama room. The beauty of this is that Tehama then um, acts a little bit like a, like a firewall. It lives on the perimeter. It is the mechanism by which um, enterprises permit their workers to access their assets. And the magic of perimeter security is that we don't really need to care about what these assets are. You could have an IBM mainframe here. You could have a legacy digital VMS mini computer. You can have more modern Oracle or open source or cloud infrastructure. It's trivially easy to protect it all in one routine flow. And none of it requires transformation in order to be protected by Tehama. And that's fundamentally the way that it works. So thin client on the user's laptop connects to a uh, provisioned machine in the virtual room. The provisioned machine enjoys uh, security features and audit and compliance features that uh, permit the enterprise to successfully manage that machine and, and support its audit and compliance. And while on that machine, the, the user has access to enterprise assets of whatever description as necessary. Um, one of the interesting uh, components of Tehama's architecture is this uh, gateway. And uh, if you will permit me, I'll explain a little bit about how it works because it actually is very special. Be Paul, before we go to the gateway, where is the secure virtual room located? In the cloud? Yes, the secure virtual room is located in any Amazon data center. So we are launched right now in uh, two, lo two data centers in the United States, uh, one in Canada, one in Germany, uh, one in Singapore, uh, and launching a new data center is essentially very easily done in a day or two on the basis of customer demand. So if customer needed us to support a, a data center anywhere where there's an Amazon data center, we're able to support that footprint. And um, So based on this architecture, it looks like you're not just converting the connectivity and uh, taking care of that. It looks like you transferring the computer itself, the machine itself into the cloud, into controlled space and controlled environment, right? So you're That's not right. letting anything to run uh, on the client, on the real client computer that can affect the remote uh, system that it's connected to. Yeah, we are, we are surfing the wave that, first of all, CFOs have always hated owning laptops because laptops as devices are off more than half the time. So it's a very expensive asset to be literally wasted. Lots of memory, lots of compute um, that is off most of the time. Uh, it's also a very capital intensive in that you have to buy it up front. And it's especially painful when you're supporting summer students that are you know, going to be with you for four months or call center workers that might be with you six to eight months. Uh, it's very painful to ship them a laptop and try to recover it when they are done. They hated owning laptops before COVID, enough for us to build the technology. Um, but they really, really hate owning laptops now. Um, CISOs hate owning laptops too for more of the reasons that you described. Um, they hate that they are very vulnerable and that it creates a data footprint for an enterprise that is literally all over the place. And with employees working from home, your data footprint is extremely porous and more or less everywhere. And that creates a, some major security and compliance headaches. And it also betrays the principle of least privilege. Human beings uh, have only analog data interfaces. We call them eyeballs and eardrums. And given that human beings can only consume data in an analog format, any uh, strategy to enable a human to access data that provides them with bits and bytes and files and USB keys and all kinds of other interfaces with which they can exfiltrate that data is a huge betrayal of the principle of least privilege. So you're right. We believe that the destiny of the enterprise desktop is the cloud. 
That's where the enterprise has the best governance characteristics. It has, to re, it has the opportunity to reclaim the costs of idle assets. It reduces this life cycle of ownership dramatically because you know, it is a big deal when Windows 10 goes end of life or when, uh, when the hardware refresh life cycle has to come and everybody needs to be reprovisioned and re-onboarded onto their new asset. Um, in a virtual machine, you know, if somebody needs 16 gigs of RAM instead of eight, it's literally like that. If somebody needs GPU, it's instant. And uh, enabling, enabling an engineering team uh, with access to like uh, incredible CPU and memory footprints is very easy on this in this mechanism. Now, one of the things that we discussed in the kickoff episode was how far can we go with the things that we do with the employees' computers, right? When we're asking them to install different type of controls and different type of you know patches and the security solutions and systems on their computer, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's another aspect that your solution actually can address, right? Right. Well, I mean, for sure, I believe that, I'm not sure if you're following the trend with um, Google Stadia or Microsoft X games, uh, X cloud games. But the idea for these platforms is that the GPU and game rendering will happen in the cloud and it will only be displayed locally where the human being is interacting with it. Um, we think that trend applies to the enterprise desktop as well. And partly it is because of what you're saying in terms of, it is just very difficult to manage the user, to manage the user experience and to keep the user doing all the right things on a machine that they have you know, physical custody of. When you put the machine in the cloud and you permit the user to access it from their home-based laptop, incredible efficiencies emerge in terms of manageability. And I can demonstrate some of that to you, but also in, in incredible efficiencies in terms of cost and management. Um, I'd like to just quickly describe how the gateway works, because I think it's interesting to your audience, and it is one of the innovative parts of our architecture. And I'm going to go to a different version of this diagram. This diagram is obviously done by marketing, and this diagram is done by techies. Marketing, techies. Um, but it is really the same diagram, and you can uh, map the uh, uh, components on this graph to this graph very easily. The only exception is that this one shows the web console as well. So I'm going to explain how that works. So essentially, when you, want to, when you create a room, which takes about 15 minutes, and you create desktops in the room, which takes like two minutes, um, and you can create as many as you want, and you can also automatically provision them with SAML and SKIM. Uh, so this can all be automatically provisioned for the user so that you don't need to have a, a manual intervention. Um, what you want to do is you want to connect this room to the customer's assets, whatever they might be. So Oracle databases, mainframes, uh, internal uh, uh, content management systems, whatever you might have that is an internal asset that you don't want to put onto the public internet. What we do is we go here to the web app and we have the ability here to establish a new key. Now that key is a single use certificate. The certificate is then put here on the router. And then what the customer does is they install their gateway, they paste in that certificate and the gateway does an outbound connectivity to our router at the edge of the room. Once the certificate is generated on the web app, the router at the edge of the room listens for that particular certificate for 15 minutes. And that's all. At the end of those 15 minutes, if it hasn't heard an inbound request from the right cert with the right certificate, it just stops listening and is only listening on our internal rooms network. The customer then installs the gateway. It does an outbound. This thing generates a new certificate, spits it back over that connectivity. This reinstantiates, and now there's a persistent connectivity for these assets into the customer's network through these endpoints. All of this is managed by the single firewall. So this is a, a kind of a mechanism where a very lightweight gateway appliance with a certificate that is generated off the strongly identified web application permits a room to have never listened to the public internet for more than 15 minutes. And even then, only with the waiting for that one certificate to visit it. And then simultaneously on the customer's network, nothing has ever listened to the public internet, which means that the customer's most secure assets have, ne have no uh, ability to do to listen to any inbound connectivity at all. No firewall SIPs, none of that sort of stuff is necessary in order to enable a Tehama room. And at that point, the users who are using the Tehama client 
are able to uh, establish their access to those Windows or, or Linux virtual desktops, and they can simply perform their work uh, seamlessly as if they've been issued an enterprise laptop. It brings me to the question of uh, how do you license the product? Is it based on mm -hmm. rooms? Is it based on uh, how many virtual desktops, uh, laptops I'm streaming up? Or how many users uh, are using or defining the system? Yeah, it is. We try to keep it reasonably simple, and, and it is definitely priced in a manner that is linear to consumption to the maximum extent possible. Um, we have a proxy for consumption called the Tehama uh, Compute Unit, or TCU. And a TCU is essentially a uh, arbitrary customer-facing unit of measure, and it permits us to lump in desktop usage with rooms and other assets, because as you can see, rooms represent actual consumption of cloud assets as well as the desktops. And essentially, the way that it works is the customer will pay a certain number of dollars per month per room, and all of the assets that require the same network connectivity can share one room. So you can create gymnasium-sized rooms if you want. However, if you want to create a zero trust network transformation, it makes a lot of sense to create a room. For example, if you're trying to enable a third party service provider to access uh, a SQL server environment, you would create a room just for them. You would establish the rules here so that only they can only access that particular environment through this room and not the rest of your network. And then the beauty of this is that these machines have no east west network traffic at all. They can only see the next hop, which is the gateway. The gateway sees only exactly what the customer sees, which means that it's a really wonderful way to permit people to access assets inside your, you know, your traditional network architecture in a manner that's compatible with a zero trust uh, layout. And then the desktops themselves, the desktops themselves are um, essentially priced by the hour. So if you use the desktop for an hour, you'll only pay for one hour. If you use it for one minute, you'll only pay for one minute. It makes it extremely cost efficient for break glass uh, use cases, as you might imagine, because in that case, you receive a lot of value from being able to light up the, the, the desktop for only an hour or two. Um, but we do have a very clever uh, elastic pricing uh, strategy where if the desktop is used for more than 60 hours in a month, in other words, if it's being used by a full-time worker, then the prices stop growing. So at 60, you're locked in, you're only going to spend 60. The next month, it resets automatically. So if you only use it, for example, 60 hours one month and then two the next, uh, it will automatically rate you only on two minutes, uh, uh, two, uh, two hours of use. And then the second you go past 60, it limits you to 60. So it's quite elastic in its use and uh, very customer friendly uh, billing model. How do you tie back to user identification? Because if you work from home, I need to understand who you are and able to let you in. Yes. So one of the things that I think is special about our platform is that we integrate a lot of different technologies into one. Okay. So we believe that in order to successfully enable a remote workforce, you need to have reasonable solutions to every one of these bubbles. And of course, one of them is identity and access management and two-factor authentication. Okay. Now, it is one important component is how do I know that I'm interacting with the person that I believe I'm interacting with? Um, Tehama uses essentially one of two strategies. Either you can use Tehama's built-in authentication, which is our Google SSO based authentication. And with Google SSO, obviously the Google domain administrator can easily uh, establish two-factor authentication. You can use either uh, the uh, YubiKey as a second factor. You can basically configure that in a, in a variety of extremely flexible ways, including with hardware tokens. Uh, but the alternative, which is a very mainstream alternative in the, in the enterprise, is to use the, the enterprise's existing uh, authentication and access management strategy. So whether they're using uh, 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 ge geofenced based uh, access controls, for example, the kind that are available with Blue Ink, you can literally with, uh, with an authentication uh, technology like that, you can say, okay, you're allowed to work from home, but you're not allowed to work from a Starbucks. And authentication will literally fail if you're not in that exact geofence that was created for you. So those kinds of more sophisticated uh, identity and access control methods are uh, compatible with Tehama, uh, but we would uh, then be integrating with that and using that as a plug-in based uh, authentication mechanism. So most enterprises that we sell into, we sell into larger enterprises, think of it as enterprises with a thousand users or more. Most enterprises that we're selling into have an identity and access management, strong authentication strategy nailed down, and we simply integrate with that. 
Okay, and uh, let's talk a little bit about the ways to access the service, right? Uh, everyone today consuming uh, both the internet and doing the work through the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of uh, options you have? Is it a client-less solution or it's only based on client or you can get installed on this yeah. uh, so client? For user experience reasons, we recommend the client-based solution. Our client is, uh, is that the Tehama client is using the state-of-the-art PC over IP ultra protocol. And I actually am going to jump a little bit because I have a slide on it um, because I think it's a very important characteristic of a remote display PC over IP technology. If you're going to be hosting your enterprise desktop in the cloud, you really need to worry about this. Um, PC over IP Ultra is a, a very, um, I would say, innovative uh, mechanism to access a remote desktop. What it does is it has the ability to take your screen and automatically separate it into 16 separate regions. If one of your regions of your screen is sending video, like imagine looking at your Zoom call right now, there's video of me, but it's in a tiny section of the screen. The protocol will automatically take that screen and it will send it in a separate protocol versus text, which is not very sensitive, which is very, very sensitive to the kinds of um, compression algorithms that video would have. Uh, and so it, what it will do is we'll then take that and it will literally put each one of these uh, regions on into a separate thread. So that if you have a multi-threaded machine on either end, it becomes extremely CPU intensive. And um, what, on a very fast network, this looks, and by very fast, I mean, at least a hundred megabits per second. That's not really very fast in 2020, but it's a moderately fast network. Uh, and I would say that under a hundred milliseconds of latency. So if you have under a hundred milliseconds of latency and at least a hundred megabits per second, you can run a 4K remote display almost from an identical user experience as if it was local. And the uh, the benefits of that experience are well worth the thin client, which works nicely on Windows, Android, Mac OS, uh, and uh, is really not a very large client. In fact, I mean, if you're ready, I could give you a quick demo of what the experience looks like, and you could uh, get a sense of, uh, of what it's like to run uh, on a Tehama desktop. Let's see if we have time when we finish with some of the questions for the Sounds open good. chat. Sure. Okay. So I'm wondering, because you run in this way, I'm guessing you're not supporting all the protocols, or maybe I'm wrong, like printing or VoIP or password reset because you work a bit differently. So yeah. maybe you can talk a bit about more. Yeah, so this machine can access essentially all of the OSI layer protocols through this router. This is a uh, completely full featured segmentation router. Uh, we are able to uh, support, for example, uh, because this machine is living in the Amazon cloud, uh, it is being adopted by police departments to perform dark web investigations. And as you know, when you're using the dark web, if you're using a browser like Tor, uh, Tor is imposes about a 95% penalty on your network performance. And so Tor runs completely on UDP. Uh, and so when you're browsing the web on Tor, it's all being done using UDP and there's enormous amount of misdirection packets that are being sent. Uh, even that experience is, is seamless. We can support uh, bi-directional video conferencing. We can support uh, VoIP and SIP uh, protocols. Uh, essentially, this machine is doing a reasonably good job of simulating a but physical in laptop. In this case, you install the customer VoIP client on this machine in the secret room? That's right. Okay. That's right. We're supporting a, a thousand person call center in this exact mo mode right now. And the, uh, the the calls are terminating on the desktop inside the room. Yep. And then the Tehama client is, uh, is essentially using the local camera and local audio uh, pickup uh, as a U USB, as an authorized USB redirection uh, device. Um, that particular capability is also used for uh, the Tehama client to be able to view uh, hardware-based authentication tokens or PIPCAC or YubiKeys or other sorts of devices that are physically on the, uh, in the user's possession. Uh, and our USB uh, redirection capability permits this machine to, to interact with those devices directly over the PC over IP protocol. How would your solution work on a slow network 
or especially if uh, the client switching roaming between networks would yep. experience some type of disconnection or interference in their work. Yeah, one of the features of the PC over IP protocol, which is not new with Ultra. So Ultra was just released in 2019. It is a major refresh of the PC over IP protocol. Tehama was a launch partner for T PC over IP Ultra. So we are very proud of our uh, relationship, including our engineering level relationship with, um, with Terra Dici, which is the developer of the PC over IP protocol. Um, one of the features of PC over IP, which is not new, is called build to lossless. And essentially what it permits is it much like, um, remember in the good old days when you would download uh, a JPEG image and it would give you a rough version and then it would slowly become better as the download was progressing. Pixelized it, version and then- Yeah, yeah, it does that. It does that even for um, remote desktops. And while the experience is a little bit rough, it is also incredibly stable on a slow or jittery network because all that really happens instead of a disconnection, all that really happens is your screen goes a little hazy during the slow slowness or the jitter. Um, now, it is possible that if you are roaming uh, while on your uh, connectivity, it is possible that if you, if you connect, you may get a disconnection. Reconnecting is pretty easy, but you may get disconnected in that case. Now, your desktop itself is fine. It's in the cloud. It has not hung up. You know, it's your connectivity to the desktop in, in the cloud that's hung up. So, so it's not I'm really disruptive to your work. So if I'm connected to SQL server and I have disconnected from the cloud on my local PC, my connection still maintained. So once I'm connecting back, I continue working like nothing. Happens. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it can happen that, uh, that you... Uh, have an occasional disconnection, but I would say that you know this is true for any technology uh, that uses that uses uh, relies on an unstable network. Um, our our platform at least leaves the desktop uh, operating in the cloud, and as such, you know it is reasonably uh, good at uh, maintaining your ability to not lose your work. You know that's something that's important, obviously. I'm actually curious what happens to this virtual station when I'm not working on it, right? Because you know, I might have like my own files, my own configuration, my own settings, my yeah. SSH keys, and what's not on that station setup. Yeah. What happens to it, to all this data when you know it shuts down? You know, hibernates or whatsoever. So there's a there's a very ver very cool trick that was invented for physical laptops, and the trick is essentially when you shut the lid on your laptop, it doesn't really go to sleep right away. It takes five or ten seconds and saves its memory file into a file on disk. And when you open the lid of your laptop, what's going to happen is instead of booting up from scratch, from off the way it would normally need to do that, it will just literally reconstruct its memory copy from, the, from that particular partition, and then it will present it to you. Um, we use that exact capability of the, which is an operating system capability. So when we disconnect from a session, we will literally just hibernate it. And when you reconnect, it will be brought back exactly where you left it with the same things on the screen. Uh, you know, if, the, if you had a web page open uh, in Chrome, Chrome will be back at the same web page. And so it's, it, it uses the same exact capability, but it lives in the cloud. Unlike opening up your laptop, it does take about 10 seconds though. So it's not like a one second process for us to bring your machine back. It takes about 10 seconds to disconnect and reconnect. Oh, what about reporting or any user behavior? Can you tell us about it? Like, sounds like you guys almost bulletproof or who can log in because there are so many different options to prevent you to log in. But can you actually provide me more information? Can you report me if somebody's trying to do something fishy or wrong? Um, yes, of course. Like, um, what, we, what we have is we have an incredibly uh, uh, detailed audit trail of what is happening in the room. So essentially everything that has ever happened in the room has a, a very clear and uh, uh, externalizable audit and event system that is visible in uh, syslog. And actually I think it might, be, might work best to show that to you. Can I create a report on how many hours you've gained spent working? Yeah, you can do a lot more than that. I'll show you quickly, hang on a second. So as I was saying, the building block of a Tehama deployment is the room. These are the rooms in this deployment. A typical customer might have between 10 and 100 rooms, depending on how they want to organize their workforce. Each room, as I was saying, has its own network connectivity. 
Uh, for example, if you enter this room and click the connection tab, you can see exactly how this room is connected to the network. You can learn exactly what its IP address is. This is where you can generate the access key that I described earlier. Um, and the room has firewall rules. The rules are custom to the room and they also have inferred rules. Inferred rules are dynamically enabled on the basis of credential escalation. So for example, this room is being used to manage an Amazon console. The customer decided that the only way that you can touch our Amazon config is through Tehama. And so what you do is you go and you escalate your privileges to this, it will create an auditable event. And during the next 900 seconds, whatever you set your TTL to be, uh, you're able to access that um, asset in the room. So that's all here. That's all configured here in the configure tab in the secrets uh, here in the, uh, for example, that particular rule for Amazon, not Cassandra, that particular rule for Amazon was configured in as a generic secret in here. And you can see that this rule permits assets, asset access. That's all configured in a web UI. All of this is workflow automated, the connection, the configuration of the, of the room, the, the desktops that are in the room, Windows or Linux, uh, the secrets that are in the room, and the members of the room is also all workflow automated. So you can have multiple organizations sharing access to a room. The platform is third party aware. You can invite other companies. Those other companies can have their own managers that are nominating users. And as you were asking about behavioral analytics, everything that has ever happened in the room is here in the activity stream. And I mean everything. We have the complete visibility and transparency of all activities that have ever occurred in the room. So for example, um, here in the session history, it is trivially easy for us to go and see what sessions have occurred. If you are curious about uh, what Dimitri did on uh, August 21st, you can very easily just go pull up a session, press play, and you can reconstruct the state of Dimitri's screen as of any point in time uh, during that session. So this is all uh, completely configurable on a room by room basis, which means that you can uh, disable screen recordings if you choose, uh, but it is a value added privilege access management feature that permits you to create uh, compliance with certain standards of care like uh, the, the uh, US government's, uh, the state of New York's uh, NYC RR500 uh, for observability of third party data access in the banking sector, or in Canada, OSFI uh, um, B10 compliance, which demands the same thing, uh, or the CIO Strategy Council's uh, 100 colon 2 uh, compliance for third party data access. Uh, all of that is supported through this. You can also see live sessions if there are any. Now, this particular room doesn't have any, but what I can do. Let's quickly show you what the connection flow looks like. Meanwhile, you're doing this. Just quick question. Who owned the Windows license or the Linux license? Is this something you guys provide or other customer need to provide? The Windows license is provided uh, and included in this capability. Um, however, you know, we do support bring your own license uh, modes. So depending on the customer's existing licensing footprint uh, for Microsoft assets or any other assets, it is totally possible for us to uh, support their um, their ability to uh, bring those assets into our perimeter. Um, as you can see, when you're ready to work, you just click and you click the connect button. It will immediately launch your desktop. Um, that desktop is uh, then, hang on a second, let me just share my entire screen so you can see that. One second, screen, share. So as you can see, I after I clicked, my desktop is here. It is a you know uh, normally featured Linux desktop. You can do what you want with it. You can go full screen on it, and you can uh, you know you can surf the web. The experience of using it is phenomenally good. It is uh, this PC over IP Ultra protocol is no joke. It is a very successful uh, mechanism to uh, share. Uh, a, a virtual desktop in the cloud. The benefit of course, is that this particular machine can be uh, phenomenally full featured. It can have uh, massive amounts of GPU or memory or CPU attached to it. Uh, it can be extremely uh, um, uh, uh, powerful from a perspective of, if you think of it as a, a virtual lab for graphics students, uh, that is a great example of a use case that is very difficult to do. Uh, here in the audit tab, you have the ability to view the screen live. So this is an important privilege access supervision capability. 
This is very much a live view of the screen. If I were to, for example, bring this window up, you'll see that um, on this session, it is lagging live at the most a couple seconds. So the auditor has the ability to uh, view not only one live session, but hundreds if necessary simultaneously. So actually you can use it not just for remote access, but also for training your you employees. Can. Yeah, and these 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 session histories, the act of, of reviewing it is in fact an auditable act. So if you go back to the activity stream, you can see that um, in the session I can actually have an audited. The fact that I viewed the session is itself audited, and all of this can be externalized to the syslog, uh, to Splunk or a SIM. Uh, but we do provide a very basic uh, way to discover uh, events. So, for example, room configuration events. Uh, you can discover every configuration history from the beginning of creating the room and you'll know who did it and from what org and the same is true for user access and what have you the other important uh, capability that i think is worth worth mentioning is that we also have the device management capability which means that the entire footprint of thousands of these machines is very easily accessed uh, you can discover where they are you can uh, view them uh, for example, the Linux desktop that I was that is on right now, it's very easy to click into that desktop and find out what it's been doing. Uh, very easy to manage its PC over IP uh, capabilities and to know if it's performing well or not. Uh, you can review active processes on it as well. Um, in this case, it's going to take a moment to load and I won't bore you, but it does take a couple seconds, but eventually you'll see, there you go. Yeah. Um, um, so we unfortunately almost out of time. I do have kind yeah. of a few questions that maybe not sure. not in the question list. Oh, for this desktop that people bring, is there ability to install antivirus or proxy to inspect where people can go? How does it work? Absolutely. So this this particular technology permits us to uh, script uh, installations on all of the platforms that we would like to on any number of the machines and on all of the systems that we want. So we can create scripts quite easily uh, and those scripts will run on any uh, of the Linux or Windows machines that are in the uh, inventory. And that means that you can very easily uh, install an antivirus, you can update patches, you can uh, uh, present uh, changes to the user experience, you can change the for example, if you don't like this image that is on the background of this Linux desktop, you can change that and you can do that all automatically from one central location. But it's not on the client machine. It's That's on the virtual, virtual machine. On the virtual machine. The client, the client machine is, uh, is a single lightweight executable. So that is uh, very rarely needs any update. If it does need an update, what will happen is when the, custom, when the user comes here to the work tab and clicks connect, they will receive an uh, uh, interface here that tells them uh, that the client requires an update and then they will very easily download it. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. It was our pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the opportunity. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.